Welcome in to another edition of Conversations with Paul Brown. Our guest is Amos Wells, who has been a part of the Anderson community for literally decades. Even in retirement, you are awful busy, so thank you for taking time out to chat with us, Mr. Wells. Thank you. You grew up in Greenwood. Right. Tell me some early Greenwood stories that you recall. Well, I grew up in a section of Greenwood called Promised Land. Uh, land I've all, all, always had dear respect for because most of the residents of that community were landowners and you all know for a minority of people that's kind of unusual and they prided themselves in self-help and self-determination and uh, always tried to do things that were right and uh, I, I work ethic, uh, believe in helping each other, helping the community, standing up for for the best part of life, and, and I've always appreciated that. Uh, Your dad was a landowner too? Yes, sir. Right. How much land did he own? He owned, uh, at one time, he owned seven, eight acres. Uh, my my great granddaddy uh, uh, bought 54 acres of land, making 50 cents a day. In what year would that have been? 1893. How unusual was it one back then for a black man in Greenwood County to right. have that much land? Right. Well, uh, he worked for the Wilkerson family, and they gave him an opportunity to buy the land. And uh, by the way, I own that land today. Do you really? Yes, I do. So he farmed it, and right. this was not a share crop. No, no, no. He, 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 was, he yeah. was the farmer. Right. In fact, I, I remember my mother, my mother telling me that during the Depression, they didn't have any money, but they had plenty of food, and they had their own cow. They had, uh, you know. Hogs. Uh, hogs, right. And uh, molasses, uh, grapes, uh, uh, blackberries, dewberries, pears. You know, just, nobody had no money back then, as you well know. But they, because they were self-sufficient, right. ate and shared, I right, guess? Right, they do. If I'm a firm believer in uh, church and community activities, he was a good uh, craftsman. He could, he could uh, as you know, a lot of folks back during those times, you had to do it your own because you didn't have no money. You were a blacksmith? Right. He yeah. was a carpenter and this type of thing and could fell a tree, tell you exactly how many bull feet was in a, in a tree. Church was part of your family's tradition. Then. Right, on where both sides. And where did, where, where, what was that part of your life like? Okay, uh, I grew up in the African Methodist. The Episcopal Church, which just celebrated some 200 years of existence, the Hebrew Church there in in uh, uh, Mount Zion, there in the Promised Land community. All, all my mother's side, there uh, African Methodist, uh, uh, and on my daddy's side, they're Baptist, so forth. And and believe it or not, my dad always participated in the AME Church because at that time his church only had service once a month. And so he went to to the AME Church because the pastor there one time said that he had 13 stewards and one deacon. <laughs> <laughs> so that seemed to work out pretty good. It worked out pretty good. Your dad, when he came along, what right. was his occupation? All right. Um, he grew up uh, as, as the son of a sharecropper. Uh, he, he worked, um, first of all, he worked for Color Electric Company. He learned how to wire houses. He worked for Pearson Angel uh, Food Distribution Company. And he also worked for... For Benjamin Plumman, which he learned how to do heating and air conditioning, he, he learned all all three trades. But as you well know, uh, not having a formal education is a little bit tough. But he did manage to buy land and also to maintain uh, a household. And uh, he inspired me to go to college, and I finished college in, uh, at South Carolina State and got my master's from Clemson University. Were you the first in your family to go to college? I was the first in my family to go to college. At what point? When you were coming up in high school, because back then you went to an all-black high school down in Greenwood. Right, Brew High School. At some point along the way, did you decide, you know, I'm going to go to college, or did a teacher inspire you? How did that come about? I had several teachers. One of them, which was uh, Mr. McLaughlin, who was the VOAG teacher, inspired me a whole lot. I had other great teachers as well, and they believed in the uh, work ethic. They believed in, in, in uh you're doing your work, and I also had parents who enforced that, uh, that I, I must get my work, and it wasn't no shucking and jiving, and uh, to go on to school to try to better myself. How hard was it to go from high school, leaving home, and going down to Orangeburg? It was not difficult, because at, at Brewer, it, it was a, a structured school. Uh, we, we had a number of youngsters who, who left Brewer and went on to college and, and finished college, because we had a, a very fine plant there. Uh, uh, the principal believed in uh, education. He believed in structure. And also he believed in uh, students should participate in developing themselves to the fullest. When did you decide 
what you wanted to do as an occupation? I guess it's from, from Mr. McLaughlin, who's my voyag teacher, uh, who, who not only taught in the classroom, but you saw him in the community because he had community work to do as well. He worked not only worked with the in-school students, but he also worked with adult farmers, so he was very well known in the community. And his, uh, uh, his guidance uh, kind of led me to be, I, I, I wanted to go into uh, uh, agriculture. And uh, also, he talked about his life there and how he came up through it and went to school at South Carolina State as well. And also, I was a member of the 4-H club, and I remember going, going to South Carolina State to some of the workshops. And, and, and I, I never forget, uh, one day I was there, after I had gotten to school, and um, this was the extension agents coming through campus about like 8 o'clock in the morning, on their way to a workshop. And I said, gee, one day I want, I want to join them. You know, to see them in their cars at 8 o'clock in the morning, dressed nice, so forth, nice cars, so forth, and carrying themselves like dignified yeah. folks. And I said, that's, that's not bad. What did you do for fun when you were in college? But trying to do things that going to be uplifting. Did you go to football games? Yes, I went to football was, games. Was the band a big deal when you were there? The band, uh, in fact, I was there when the one-on-one was formed. Uh, were you uh, really? Because yeah, Dr. Cassidy Van came to South Carolina State and taught uh, the band the, the uh, eight to five march uh, precision steps, and uh, I was there when it was formed. Well, that's quite a historical yeah. right. part on your part that right. you were there, and, and now mm -hmm. they're, I mean, they're known all over the country. That's right. And believe it or not, there are, Two other folks who was here, who, who lived here in Allison, who was a member of, uh, of that first band, Vance Klinskill and Harriet. Uh, uh, she was, she's Harriet, Harriet Klinskill now, but both of them are here in Allison. And they, they were part of that original first band. They were part of that first band. How about that? that? Uh, they were the gun and blue band before then, but after then they, they renamed themselves the, the, the March of 101. Yeah. And really it was patterned after the famous uh, FAMU band, which was the March of 100, so they didn't want to copy the name. So, so they said 101. 101, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> your uh, your mother was a gardener, right? So you learned, right? You were out there as a young, and tell me about growing up in Promised Land and gardening. Coming. Well, uh, folks always said she had a green thumb because she she could make almost anything grow. She knew how to uh, garden. We, we we grew vegetables and uh, had pigs and so forth, and uh, we always can or froze, make sure we had plenty for the winter, this type thing. And uh, we would go pick blackberries, go get peaches and this type thing, can them, make peach preserves, uh, make peach pickles and so forth. So that was part of the preservation that we had enough to, to last us during the winter. You graduate from South Carolina State, right. and the year is what? 1965. We're in the throes of integration? Uh, a tidbit here. I am the last extension agent to be hired in the old segregated system before it was integrated with the Clemson, you know, uh, Clemson 1862 institution, South Carolina State is 1890 institution. The last one. The last one. Uh, so before there there were black extension agents right. hired through South Carolina State. State. Right, right. And then your primarily duty would have been to go into the black community? Right, right. And then after integration it started slowly changing where we work with everybody. When you came back, where did you come to with when you got hired as an extension agent? All right, I was hired to go to Florence, South Carolina, Florence County in Florence, okay? I worked there five years, and then I got a promotion. I came to Anderson in 1971. How did you meet your wife, Jackie? Uh, I was there in Florence, and I met her at the church. So she's she's from down in the lower part of the right, state. Right. She, she's uh, she's from Florence County, and her aunt was an uh, extension agent. Her aunt was a coworker of mine. Oh, mm -hmm. so did she introduce you? Did she no, say she, I, she, no, she didn't. She had nothing to do with it. No, no, no not really. <laughs> What was it like when you went to Jackie's mom and said, I'm taking your daughter back to Anderson? Uh, I wish you could have been around and see when we, when, when my mother kid to her said, okay, say my son came down here and whatever, and we, 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 my dad was living at the time and brother, and between the moving van, two or three cars, the truck, moving, and, 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 and her mother was kind of saying, here you come back and kick my daughter and take her back down. So that, that, would, that would have been a sight to see. Okay. I bet it would have been. Right. Mm -hmm. What was it like when you came to Anderson to take over the job? Because at this point, extension is becoming integrated. Right. Uh, Anderson uh, was a progressive. They had a big 4-H program. In fact, my first job, first uh, task here, believe it or not, even before I got settled in my house, was to go to 4-H club, 4-H camp. Because we took three bus loaded kids, integrated 
uh, situation, went down to Camp Long near Aiken for a week uh, for, for camp. And uh, that because that 4-H was really big here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, got along quite well and had, had a wonderful experience. Our guest is Amos Wells, and when we return, we're going to continue our conversation with him. When you came to Anderson, how was the work divided up among the extension agents? Did you have a, a, a particular area of expertise? Most of mine was in horticulture and 4-H. And the uh, uh, way it worked is wh whoever call came in, and whoever was available took the next call. And uh, uh, her Merritt was the county agent at yeah, the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. And and from the beginning, it was a pleasant experience when you came back to right. Anderson. It was right, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not far from home down in mm -hmm. Greenwood, right? Florence is a little longer when you had to take your wife home to visit. Right. Mm -hmm. What were the some of the challenges that you faced coming to Anderson as a new agent with what five years experience? Well. Uh, First of all, people wanted to find out if you knew what you was talking about, you know, so you had to win that confidence and by letting them know that you knew what you was talking about and that you had their best interest at heart. You wasn't trying to run no game on them, this type of thing. And, and, uh, but people are willing to uh, will receive help if you, you're willing to help them. So you, you got to let them know that you, you're people oriented. I've always been a people oriented person. How many people were in the uh, Anderson office when you came? Ooh, it was, there were a lot. It was, right, because we, we were one of the biggest counties in the state at the time because we, we had a diverse agriculture program, we had a diverse 4-H uh, program, we had a diverse home economics program, plus we had the FLEP program, which was expanded food and nutrition. Florence County was one of the pilot counties, and Alice County was one of the pilot counties, which was one of the better programs that the Extension Service ever had. And interestingly enough, when you retired, that office was down to, could you count them on one hand? Uh, almost. Yeah. Almost. It, 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 it was doing the damn. T times were changing. Right. And as you, you well know, as more and more folks move to the cities, the urban interests were secondary. Right. But I still say that the extension is needed because you get unbiased stuff. Most most other stuff now, uh, they're willing to help you, but they got they got a bottom line they're looking at. And, and the extension didn't have no bottom line other than trying to get the work out and get the research that was done, not only at Clemson, the University of Georgia, across the nation out to the people where he could help them and make their lives better. At one point, did um, you get a phone call about going on the radio in Anderson? I did. <laughs> Tell me that story. Well, uh, I got the, uh, I went down to uh, WRX in, uh, uh, and believe it or not, uh, I, one time I had the record there for, for answering the most calls in an hour. I answered 48 calls in a one hour period. You had a talk show, basically. Right. You would go down to the radio station, right. and Matt Phillips would right. be there, right. and you would take questions on gardening. Right. Well, and people, I mean, yeah. it, was, it would not be unusual in the community to hear somebody say, well, Amos Wells said. Right. <laughs> and, and they took what you said to the bank. Right. I, I tried to be accurate. And truthful with folks, I, I realized that their livelihood and, and their life sometimes depended on what I said, and I won't always be correct. And 47 call, 47 40, answers. 40, 48. That, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, right. What were the other, you, you were involved in 4-H, you had the radio program. Um, can, can you think of an interesting story when you went out on a call to somebody's house to help them with a problem uh, that, that might be humorous? One was, uh, fuck, well, he's, he's deceased now, but I uh, went out to a fellow uh, farm out in the Five Fox area, and I was talking to him about uh, playing, uh, at that time, was a relatively new Friday cone called Seneca Chief. And he's used to playing the old mutton or the open pollinated type cone, which grew the great big stalk, and you had to catch it at half clip in order to eat it as a as a, as a rose near. And Silk uh, uh, Seneca Chief grew a short stalk, and uh, I, I talked to him and getting a pound or so, and he planted it, and uh, uh, he looked at it, and he noticed it has began to tassel, and the tassel, you know, kind of short. And uh, he said, ain't, ain't much to this cone. This cone, cone can't be no good. And he, he, he did, you know, do what he needed to do for his uh, cultivating. And when the cone came in, he went and got it. And, and Seneca Chief made a nice, small ear, but it was compact. And okay. it produced more cone that you would really think of, would come off a small ear cone. And he carried home his wife, cooked some, and he, and he came back. He said, uh, I, I, I didn't think much of this cone until my wife cooked something for dinner. And said, this cone is jammed up, and he started growing it and selling it and made good money from it. You know? Did he really? He did, right. 
The other thing that, that you're credited with is you helped bring the farmer's market to Anderson County. Right. T- tell me the story leading up to that decision. Why did we need one, did you think? Well, first of all, uh, we have been traditionally a, a beef, dairy, and rural crop county. Cotton was pretty big here one time. And as those began to play out, I say play out, you know, the acreage was going down, and the number of folks, we needed another alternative to try to get back into making money, and everybody couldn't afford to buy uh, $100,000 $100, sprays to, order to, to, to stay in the, in the big-time farming. But you could make a decent living by growing vegetables because you, you're talking about probably 70 days, 80 days before you have a return on your investment, whereby you're looking at cotton you plant in, in April, you don't harvest to what, October. So right. you've got no money coming in. You plant vegetables in April. By June, you got a return coming. And again, you can plant uh, another crop in July, and it's ready to harvest in September. And also, there are collards, there are turnip greens, there's mustards, and so forth. And also, a number of the folks who uh, say city folks, for folk, they lack the taste of uh, fresh homegrown vegetables. And also, I think it created uh, a nice uh, mixture of rural and city folks getting together. Because a lot of down through the years, there's always been some kind of myth between city folks and rural folks. And, and that got a, got a chance to kind of break some of those myths out of the way and realize we all need each other. The current farmer's market, that's the second location that we've had in That's, that's the second, yeah, right. One. And now we have farmer's markets in other cities in Anderson. Right. Where okay. are they? Well, you got, you got, we, we started one in Belton, you had right. one, got one in Pendleton, uh, you, you got several around, plus, you know, the Jock Lot came on, which kind of, kind of a spinoff, it's a, diff, it's a different uh, setup, but, uh, uh, which has, has made tremendous impact. We weren't competing with the Jock Lot because right. it's a different, different type of situation. Yeah. And also, we were instrumental in going across the state and trying to help other counties set up farmers markets, been to uh, Cherokee County, down to uh, uh, a number of counties across the state to, to help them get started and also worked in training programs with folks to, to, to teach them th- some of the fundamental things they need to do and work with growers and also how to get the word out to the people. Yeah. One of the, the, the benefits is that is I've seen the situation where farmers have gotten up like 5 o'clock in the morning to go out and pull corn, especially during the heat, where it be nice and fresh, and bring that corn, let's say, at the market at 7, 7.30, by 9 o'clock, they're going back home, nice pocket of money. You won't get that cone that fresh now at the grocery store. They got nice cone. Yeah. But it's probably been picked two weeks ago, huh? In Hydro Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. Yeah. But it doesn't get any fresher than that. What is it like for you on a Saturday morning or whenever you come to the farmer's market in Anderson to walk through that and see the fruits of your labor? Well, I, I, I think it's done good for not only the, the grower, it's done good for the consumer as well because they get a, a fresh product, uh, it's a tasty product, it's, it's good for them nutritionally, and I also I think about the economic impact that it has. I remember what Phyllis did go now. He came to one, I think one of the better praises I've ever had in my life. He said, Mr. Wells, I, I, I had enough money from selling my vegetables. When my wife got sick, I go to my, my nest egg and pay for it without any problem. You know, that's one of the benefits of working to take care of your bills mm-hmm. without having to dip it into your, your life savings and to see that happen. You may have retired from extension, but you haven't retired from living. You've been awful busy since you hung it up. Tell me some of the activities that you do on the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, besides uh, with your daughter, uh, Kelly Jo, down at the Senior Citizen uh, yeah. Program, and we usually repot flowers down every year and, and uh, 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 various things. Uh, we have a breakfast program out in our community center. Uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, even when I was at Ann Mead one time, and the nurses found out who I was, and they came and started asking me questions. In fact, the doctor said, leave the man alone. <laughs> <laughs> and, however, I, I didn't get any discount, though. <laughs> our guest is Amos Wells, and when we come back, we're going to conclude our conversation with him. Before we go, Amos, a couple of years ago, two years ago, you were... Uh, presented with a very special award, the uh, Senior Citizen of the Year Award. Mm-hmm. Um, how surprised were you at that? Very surprised. What kind of tipped me off when I saw my son walk in with his family, and I saw a friend of mine who, who uh, was a co-worker down in, in Greenwood County walk in. 
You know why I saw my brother? I said, like, something's up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and Kelly Joe pulled it off. She got, she got me good. She, she had called my wife when I was away. And it, it was a, a pleasant surprise. And, and, and uh, I think the Senior Citizen Award is one of the finest awards you can see because it, it, uh, uh, it helps people to realize that you appreciate it for some of the stuff that you've done and trying to help other people. And one of the things I thought I've always uh, treasured in life that you can't live in this world by yourself. Somebody going to help you, but you got to be willing to help out to uh, help somebody else and to who much is given, much is required. And I believe in that and, and, and trying to make life on this earth a lot better. Do you think, Amos, that the young people coming up now uh, have a green thumb? Are they interested in doing this? Is this tradition going to continue with this new generation? I hope so, but I, I thing that bothers me the most we have a uh, some, some of the adults. We give our children too much instead of making earn it. I came through a generation where you had to earn everything, and there's nothing wrong with earning because you earn it, you cherish it, and you won't throw it away. When it's given to you, you think you have an entitlement, and I got news about entitlements. Entitlements don't last. Only those things that you work for will last because you you're going to work hard to keep them, maintain them, and make sure it's passed on. Uh, so I like to see all of our uh, young people learn to have an appreciation for where their food come from. And nothing wrong with growing a few tomato plants, even you in the city. You get in your flower bed, two tomato plants provide you enough tomatoes the whole summer. You got water, even if you're bath water, take the water and put it out around there. It, the ground going to filter it out. There's nothing wrong with that. Amos Wells, it's been a delight for you to share your stories with us. Thank you for taking him out of a busy schedule to sit down with us. Okay, very good. Our guest has been Amos Wells. We want to thank each of you for tuning in and invite you to be back with us next time for our next edition of Conversations with Paul Brown. Until then, take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.